Hello everyone, my name's Liz Mays and I'm the Chief Exec of The Common Room. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about The Common Room and what we do. So what I'm going to do is run through a number of slides that explain our project and our charity. What I'm going to do is talk you through what The Common Room is, a bit of history about us and the project that I'm leading, um, the background to the project and why it was needed, what we've done to make it happen, progress so far and our future plans uh, both in terms of our building which I'll tell you a little bit more about later and our charitable activity and then obviously it would be remiss of me not to talk about the impact that the coronavirus pandemic has had on us and the way we've had to review our strategy for sustainability towards the future. Um, so the title of this is Finding a New Path Forward for one of the world's oldest institutions and that is exactly what we're doing. We're taking on the legacy of the North of England Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers in Newcastle. This is our building, uh, Neville Hall. It's on the corner of Orchard Street and Westgate Road, so just next to where the taxis um, pull, pull up near the central station and then next door to it is the Lytton Fill. So we're right in the centre of town and um, it's an incredible building built in 1872 to house the North of England Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers. Um, this is a, a, a a painting of what it looked like when it was built, a pretty imp impressive place, I'm sure you'll see. Um, but as um, I'll explain as we go through, you know, at the current state, the, the building has seen better days. It was in massive need of a full refurbishment and a repurposing, really, to reinvigorate it. Um, so the the Institute itself, which is better known to most people as the Mining Institute, was established in 1852 to advance the science and art of mining. And it was within this building that some of the great innovations that fueled the Industrial Revolution at that time um, were invented right in the centre of, of Newcastle in the northeast of England. And the technologies that were innovated and developed in this building were exported across the globe and enabled um, coal mining to become much safer. They enabled the coal to be dug out in a more profitable way, which supported the growth of wealth. Um, the peak of membership of the Institute itself was in 1911, when they had around two and a half thousand members and more than 40 percent of them were based internationally. And this was really a hub for innovation and for engineering in its day. And um, because it was that it has it grew uh, an impressive uh, historic collection of artefacts, books and journals and other gems, uh, which are now part of the collection that is owned by the Common Room. And I'll tell you why, why it is ours now. And um, one of the gems of the collection, which not a lot of people know about, is that we've got a full set of Eiffel Tower blueprints. They were um, gifted to the Institute by Eiffel himself. They are signed um, and they are owned here in, in the centre of Newcastle and nobody really knows we've got it. Um, the collection that we've got that we now own has been described as one of the two most important in the world for the study of the birth of the Industrial Revolution. And that's something for this region to be really proud of. Um, so this is what the building looked like when it was built. This is a visualisation of what we hope the building will look like when we get back into it towards the back end of this year. And um, really, you know, just bringing this building back to its former glory and opening up to the region is a real, really important driver for, for what we're trying to do. Um, but just to explain what the project is, it's by no means backward looking. So the heritage is really critically important. But what this building really represents is an ongoing economic specialisation in the northeast um, in engineering. And what we aim to do with the building when we eventually get to reopen it is to have it become once again a hub for business, for innovation, for engineering and um, to help shape the future of the region as this building once did. So before I talk about the how, it's worth flagging that the reason this project was so important is because this building was on the verge of being sold. Um, the Probably from the 1950s onwards, from the nationalisation of coal, um, the Institute lost degree awarding powers to the universities. There was a general migration of uh, institutes such as this down to London. And so the Mining Institute spent all of its money and reserves really trying to stay afloat. Um, the most recent attempt prior to this project to save it from being sold as a building and have its collection dispersed was 10 years ago there was an attempt at a joint venture with our neighbours the Lytton Phil. Um, unfortunately neither organisation at that point were really ready to give up any of their independence to see this through so that all 
fell through and really it was you know on the verge on the verge of collapse at that point and you know to be honest there's there's not uh, you know as we sit today we haven't inherited a lot of reserves you know the value of our charity really is is tied up within that building itself but that brings me on to where we are today and in uh, 2015, a new path was set out whereby the Institute would set up the Common Room of the Great North ourselves as a new charity um, uh, to become an independent charity and that we would lead the project to secure the future and regenerate that building. Um, and in June 2018, we, were, we found out that we had been successful with our large scale bid to National Lottery Heritage Fund to fully renovate the building and to set us up on a sustainable path. Uh, towards the future. Um, in total, what we're doing with the project itself is spending £7.1 million pounds, um, on the building itself. Um, it's grade two star listed, so it has to be given due uh, consideration as, as it gets restored. Um, of the £7.1 million, £4.1 million pounds is grant from National Lottery Heritage Fund, and the remainder is from other donors and funders, organisations such as the Reefs Foundation and one of our key supporters, um, plus the Platinum um, Family Fund, which is run through the Community Foundation, uh, national funders like the Garfield Western Foundation, Wolfson and the Foyle Foundation um, are, all, are all kind of significant funders in this project. Um, we also are really grateful that we've got a cash flow loan from the North East Local Enterprise Partnership for £1.5 million, which has enabled us to do this project to have more time to raise the match funding. So we do still have around a million pounds to raise to offset this loan. Clearly, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has had a major impact on our financial situation. Um, but towards the end of the, the, the talk, I'll cover our needs in that regard. Um, so what is our vision as a charity? We have a pretty simple vision, and that is to use our unique heritage to inspire the next generation of innovators and engineers. Um, I joined the organisation in September 2017, having spent the three years prior to that as the regional director of the EEF um, in, in the North East, which is now called Make UK. It's one of the UK's, well, it's the UK's largest manufacturing trade body. And then the um, 12 years prior to that, I worked for the CBI in the North East. And Throughout this time, there had been a con constant drumbeat from manufacturers and engineers about the skill shortage that the region was facing. And whilst I could see that there were a number of, you know, nationally and regionally driven initiatives to try and make this shift so that young people understood how important engineering was, it still wasn't really getting through that, you know, the, that the region was full of engineering companies that would offer great opportunities for young people to move through and obviously I'm sure you'll all agree with me that even that now more than ever that's absolutely a message that we need to um, continue to push through to support our region's young people. Um, everybody knows that we were a great engineering region it's just this perception that manufacturing and engineering doesn't exist anymore in the same way um, but it does it looks different but it does and so this project felt to me like a really unique way that we could um, solve an economic imperative and support the region's growth and um, so when I joined the organization with without having any background in heritage you know I've always worked in the private sector we um, set about talking to our stakeholders to see whether other people bought into this vision because ultimately this was the vision that we pitched to National Lottery to secure the funds for the project itself um, and we're really pleased that we've had great buy-in from some really important regional players including Nissan who are working with us on some of our heritage enrichment module work with their apprentices and um, Caterpillar who hosted our exhibition and ran school sessions with us at their plant in Peterley and um, companies like NBS who um, are based in the centre of Newcastle um, but again shared into this into this vision and um, you know a whole wealth of other businesses are really brought in which is really important for us to make sure that we add that level of authority to what we're saying about engineering you know this isn't just a museum project just a heritage project it's really focused on the northeast economy um, and I've got a really sort of personal uh drive to move this through you know this this organization that we're now running is very much a startup you know it was never really within my ambitions to run my own business but that seems to be what I'm what I'm doing um 
seeing it that National Lottery are our main investors, you know, they, they are monitoring and taking note of our activities, plus the pressure of us being a charity means we're closely regulated by the Charities Commission. Um, but we had a lot of work to do to really make sure that we could be a forward facing, modern fit for purpose organisation to be able to deliver this vision. So um, this is my team. Um, over the last two years, we've worked with a plethora of brilliant heritage and culture specialists to get our project off the market. And now we've got our permanent team in place. There are seven of us. Um, and then at a board level, our chair is Matt Boyle, who was the chief executive of Sevcon before he stepped back from that a couple of years ago. He's an engineer by background. Um, and then our broader board is a mix of heritage, culture and business. Once we get closer to reopening, we will be recruiting again. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about uh, our building and explain what our business model was intended to be before I talk about the kind of coronavirus impact on us. Um, we, I believe, have one of the most beautiful spaces in Newcastle within our building that most people would not have been in, even though it was their ancestors, their great grandparents, their grandparents whose hard work supported this to be built. Um, this brilliant space is the Nicholas Wood Memorial Hall. Nicholas was the founding president of the Institute. He was a contemporary of Stevenson, um, of George Stevenson. Uh, they worked very closely together on the early innovations around the railways. Nicholas was an expert in technical drawing um, and supported um, George with that side of things. Robert Stevenson was then apprenticed to Nicholas Wood. So Nicholas Wood sits resplendent in his Wood Memorial Hall. Um, this picture was taken prior to the renovations beginning. It, it was already a brilliant space um, as you can see this is this is slightly enhanced photo to make it look warm anybody who had been in that space knows that it was freezing and um, we are also working to uh, replace the patchwork carpet that is in place um, what we want to do with the building is become a sustainable charity whereby the profits from our trading company that will trade around weddings conferences meetings and events um, within our building the profits from that will support our charitable purpose but in order to do that we've got to first make the building fit for purpose make it modern make it warm accessible um, with all modern facilities so I'll share a few more pictures of the building um, for you to have a look and obviously we would love it if people um, get in touch with us and want to find out more about what we're doing in the building and how it can be used in the future when we when we can um, get back to um, meeting again so this is the wood hall just after it had been um, emptied uh, it's pre-construction again but um, we had sent 800 crates of books to storage uh, plus our legacy furniture um, at the early stage of the construction works um, we started to unearth some hidden features in the, in the building, which was really, really exciting. So we appointed Brims, um, Brims Construction, who are a Sunderland based contractor to do the main contract. They're working under the kind of supervision of our project managers, Gardner and Theobald, um, and our architects, the Howarth Litchfield Partnership, a Durham based architects firm who specialise in heritage projects. Um, on this picture here, this is a door that goes through to a bridge which links our organisation to the Lytton Fills building, but the carving above the door had been hidden um, probably for the best part of 100 years behind a war memorial plaque. So the, the plaque itself is coming back into the building, um, but will be housed in a different space. Um, the carving itself um, shows a minor safety lamp and it uh, shows the Money Institute logo, um, motto, which is Monio and Munio, which means I protect and I advise. So we found that little hidden gem as we were unearthing, um, uh, stripping back the building, really. Um, again, this is another pre-construction shot. This was a, this is the main foyer and entrance area. And this is what we hope it will look like when we have renovated it. And um, we want to make sure the heritage is kind of riven through the whole building. So you'll see the design for the chandelier is inspired by the minor safety lamps that were innovated in our building. And the artwork that we visualised on the wall is from some of Lord Armstrong's workings on electricity. Um, this space is our glorious lecture theatre. Um, it's it needs it needs a bit of restoration. We'll be installing kind of modern AV, um, high spec AV equipment into that space so that it can be used better for more meetings and events. The lecture theatre itself is modelled on the Royal Institution. Um, it's smaller though, so it seats about 100. Um, around the outside of it, what you can see on this picture are the uh, uh, portraits of the past presidents of the Institute 
all of which, apart from one, are male. Uh, Catherine Miller was the first female president of the Institute in the last few years. Um, but, you know, obviously one of the key challenges we have in, in um, supporting young people into engineering is making sure that they understand that this this may have been what the, what the past looked like, but actually, you know, engineering is much more diverse now and there's more scope for diversity um, in many ways. And that's something that me and the team are particularly passionate about and that will be um, riven through our whole programme. Um, this beautiful feature is a skylight, which is within the one of the buildings on the top floor. The building is uh, the the room is called the arbitration room. Um, this is where the mine owners and the mine workers would meet to decide on rates of pay um, and conditions with uh, discussed conditions within the mines. Um, again, that you know the top floor of the building hadn't been used that much. Um, this is what we hope it will look like. Uh, when it has been refurbished, a beautiful space for events, dinners, weddings. Um, and then we will also be on site opening a cafe bar to the public, um, which we call Five Quarter. Five Quarter is the name of one of the coal seams that runs through the Great Northern Coal Field um, uh, throughout the region. We thought it was fitting for, for that and it's um, it, it sparks interest, people understanding what, what that um, name is derived from. Um, the, this will be on the ground floor. This is just um, an early, uh, early in the construction process uh, view within that space. Um, and this is our beautiful mood board to give you a, a, a touch of the look and feel for how how the uh, five quarter cafe bar will be will be open. Um, we're also planning to host weddings. Um, it's already been used for weddings, but obviously we're you know, modernising and making it fit for purpose. So um, we that's part of our business plan to be a wedding venue. It is incredibly church like, but completely secular as a as a building, um, which appeals to a lot of couples. And then there is a, an events and conferences offer. And with this one, we really want to make sure that, you know, the business community can meet in this space. And actually, you know, there'll be interactions that happen when people are sat in the lobby um, that will actually, you know, support the innovation that needs to happen in the region going forward. Um, so the final set of slides just picks up on how we're delivering our charitable mission. Obviously, because we have not been in the building for a long time, we moved out in January 2019. Um, we have um, been out on the road. So this map shows where we've travelled. Um, coronavirus affected the last part of this. And so we did not get to go to the sill over the summer, as you would expect. But we do hope to go there. Um, our exhibition has been a really great backdrop for education and engagement and for running oral history sessions um, and that has toured around the region. It's been seen by about 35,000 people um, and we'll bring it back into the building once we can get to reopen it. Um, and then there is our education programme. So, so much of what we do is focused on inspiring young people to go into STEM and we use the UN Sustainable Development Goals as the sort of overarching framework with which to support them because ultimately engineers respond to challenges and they change lives. And so we have um, workshops that we do with school children, predominantly primary schools, um, to um, get them really thinking about how they might be able to change the world and what they're interested in. And these are just some examples of, of some of the brilliant um, innovations that have come about. Um, the other part of our on the road programme, which is ongoing, is that we, we um, appointed a youth board. So it's a set of young people who work across a number of sectors from um, software, engineering, um, arts, heritage, culture, um, training, education. So it's the intention is that really because this is our core audience for the building we need them to um, engage with us and tell us what we need to be doing and we're so we're taking them through a leadership development program at the moment but in due course they will become a real sort of shadow board for our organization um and so i'll just i'll just finish with it with a couple of notes on kind of where we are now because obviously coronavirus has knocked us for six in terms of what our plans would have been interestingly we found we found this as we were um, doing more excavations at the start of the year and so I naively thought that the worst thing that was going to happen to us this year was that we would find a couple of medieval wells in the building um, but no that we were then hit with a global pandemic um, our intention as an organisation had been to reopen in November this year to be fully sustainable based on a solid business plan for meetings and events in the building and 
um, that's not, not deliverable now. So what we're doing at the moment is we've been successful with getting some emergency funds from National Lottery Heritage Fund to get us through to the period to the end of March. So to keep the team engaged, to finish the building and to do the fit out required to get us ready to open. We're just in the process of reviewing our business plan to see what we need to do to change it, to make it sustainable. As I said, you know, there's no money in the charity, really. We're, um, you know, we're... We, we've got a job to build up our reserves over the next few years. And so we really just need a first chance to, to get open next year. And we're hopeful that our ongoing discussion with the National Lottery Heritage Fund will really will really support that. Um, in the meantime, the team and I are all working from home, juggling um, the challenge that comes with that. Um, while, meanwhile, the building is, is still going ahead. We expect to be able to get the keys in December um, and we will be opening either at some point in the spring if not the summer with a slightly different program for next year if anybody um, visited us during the great exhibition of the north in summer of 2018 we would really love to get that vibe back into the building that um, enthusiasm something that's public facing family facing um you know to, to begin to launch this but ultimately it will come down to whether we can convince our investors to um to give us a chance to do that so i will just finish with our hashtag which i would love it if all of you could start sharing and have a little look at on our social media and um, the hashtag common good because uh, ultimately everything that happens within this organization that happens with our space and whether you buy a coffee in the a cafe or you come to one of our events or you hold your wedding there all of it is for the common good and um, so i'll finish at that point and thank you very much for listening